People often say that hindsight is a wonderful thing. We say that phrase a lot, don't we? Hindsight's a wonderful thing. When we can look back on a situation or a time and see, oh, I should have done it that way, or I shouldn't have done it this way. Um, this is, uh, or we can look back and just see what was really going on in a situation, what was really happening. And we understand things better, perhaps, when we look back. When we're in the midst of a situation, when they're in the midst of a particular time, we don't always understand what's happening to us, or we don't always understand the situation. Sometimes looking backwards, we can see with clearer vision, we can see with um, open eyes as to what was happening to us or what was going on in a particular scenario. People are already talking about starting COVID inquiries to inquire into that and think, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? What could we have done better? What could we have done worse? In order, hopefully, to prepare for something else like that that would happen again. Um, and I'm sure that will be a long investigation to, to see, see what went on in these things. And perhaps looking back on the situation, we may understand what we did right or what we did wrong or what we do differently next time. What we learned, what we were taught. We've certainly learned much over this period, haven't we, about all kinds of different things. And I think for us as Christians, particularly, um, hindsight is a glorious thing because we can look back and see what God was doing in our situation, what God was teaching us. And it's not just a good thing, it's a glorious thing because we can look back and say, wow, I can really see what God was doing in that moment. Even in, in that moment was just darkness and confusion and sorrow and pain. Even in those times, we can look back on them and say, here's what God was doing. Now, I, the reason I say that it's because right at the start of this letter, uh, when Paul's writing to this church at Corinth that he knows, and I, that's why I asked George to read that passage from Acts 18, like we did with when we started Philippians, I find it just helpful uh, to put a bit of context to the letter to see his actual ministry that happened in Corinth. I, I decided not to read the whole of 1 Corinthians as well, because I think that we wouldn't have time for much preaching if we did that. But, uh, but in looking in, in this passage to this church that he knows, uh, he says, to the church of God that is at Corinth, with all the saints there. He's writing to them, and he's beginning by writing about his suffering. Writing about painful memories. But Paul has the blessing here of being able to look back with hindsight and see God's purposes in his suffering. Now, right at the outset, I want to say, we aren't always able to look back and go, that's what was happening in that situation. We may never know. And maybe when we go to be with the Lord, we might. Or we might not even care by the time we get there. We might be quite happy where we are. Thank you very much. But we, who knows? But sometimes we can. We can look back. And Paul, look, looking backwards and speaking of his sufferings, and he'll write much about his sufferings throughout this letter, uh, partly to defend himself and partly to show that that's often the way that God works through suffering and weakness and not through power uh, and um, the victory that the world tends to think of when it comes to these things. He, he, he writes it in a very self-defensive way against his critics because he has to uh, in, in this situation. But he begins by reflecting on his suffering and he says these, these particular uh, times that he was talking about, that he and, and the other apostles suffered, and Timothy uh, talks about them, and, and he sees God doing two things. You can look back and see God doing two things. Uh, it, was to, it was so that they would be able to comfort others, is the first. Uh, in their sufferings, they were comforted by God that they might comfort others. And secondly, to teach them to depend on God. So it's, firstly, it's for the benefit of others. And it's so that they themselves might learn to depend on God. And in the first, verses 3 to 7, we see that first uh, idea that Paul has, that knowledge that Paul has about what God was doing. He was comforting them so that they might comfort others. The God of all comfort comforted them so that they might be a blessing to others. So you look at verse 3. He starts, and the, I, I love this about Paul, despite everything he's going to write. Uh, if you were to look ahead in this letter and think, look at all the things he's writing, uh, and think about all the suffering and all the difficulty and all the pain, he begins in verse 3 by saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He begins with praise. He begins with praise to this God. 
and only has good things to say about him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. It's not a wonderful thing that that is the way that we can describe our God as the Father of mercies, the one who bestows mercy on us, mercy after mercy towards us. His mercies are new every morning. He has shown us mercy in Christ and he continues to show us mercy every day. He's the God of all comfort. You know, it's, it's not always good. Not a lot of people can say that about their God. You look at some of the gods of other religions and, and um, historically other religions as well. Remember at Bible college having to look through different, uh, the way, different creation myths, you know, the, the way different cultures thought that the world was created. And their gods were terrible. They were, they, were just, they were just like people. That was the problem. They were vicious, rival people who killed each other in order to take over the world. Whereas you read Genesis 1 and it's this God who creates and this God who shows loving mercy and kindness and grace to sinful people. He's the father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And that's only the first half of the sentence. He says, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comfort, comforted by God. This is Paul already showing part of the purpose of his and others' suffering. And there's all kinds of afflictions that he's going to talk about. Some of them are physical, very physical. Just read some of the later chapters. Others are a sort of spiritual battle. There's all kinds of things going on. But he talks about the purpose here. And the purpose uh, in Paul's suffering and his suffering as an apostle, his suffering for Christ, is so that he might comfort others. This is part of their purpose anyway. Because as they suffered, they themselves experienced the comfort of God. God comforted them personally. It's interesting. You often find this, I think, in life sometimes in churches. You speak to people who have suffered the most. I think people who have suffered the most are often so good at just knowing how to comfort others. They know when to speak. They know when not to speak as well. And they just have that ability to do so. It's so easy for us in seeking to comfort people, to to give out trite answers or just talk all the time or just want to, you know, fix a problem. But so often, uh, people, it's surprising the way people can be good at comforting others. I remember uh, reading not so long ago, actually, Mez McConnell's book um, called The Creaking on the Stairs, and it's written about his experiences of childhood abuse and how can I understand God in all the midst of this. And he said that that the best answer he, he asked, he used to ask people, why does this happen to me? Why has this happened to me? And he said people used to give even biblical answers, but just at the wrong time and in the wrong way. <laughs> and that was the problem. He said this one guy, he said it to this one guy in his church, and this one guy just said, Mez, I've no idea. And gave him a big hug and says, I'll see you later. And Mez says, that was the best answer I'd ever had. The guy just said, I've no idea. And he felt comforted. And I think that person was somebody who had had wisdom and experience and, and had, had been through those trials themselves. Part of our experience of suffering perhaps enables us to comfort others with the comfort with which we ourselves have been comforted. To sit and to to listen to people and to comfort them with the truth about God. Uh, And knowing how to do that. But we share the comfort of Christ and the comfort from Christ. That This is what Paul was saying that they themselves had experienced. Through them, God brought comfort to these believers. And Paul continues, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. Now you see see the parallel there? It's both. If there's one thing you want an abundance of, it's probably not suffering. That's not something any of us would choose. We wouldn't say, I want to suffer abundantly. I I don't want that. Abundant comfort, I'll have plenty of that, you know. Keep that coming, but suffer abundantly. I don't want anything to do with that. But Paul says the two go together because they have experienced abundant suffering. The pain of that, they've still, as a result, they've needed that abundant, (laughs) abounding comfort is what I'm trying to say there, abounding comfort that comes with that. And it's almost like he's saying, I can't have one without the other. I can't have experienced the need for the comfort from God without experiencing the suffering that comes with it. 
Quite often as Christians, we can say, I really want to know God. I really want to know him in a deeper and in a more profound and in a closer way. I want to feel like God is standing right next to me every day and you know, walking through life together. And, and, and we don't think to ask the question, am I ready for that? Am I prepared for the implications of that? Because so often knowing God in, and growing in our relationship with him, how often does that come through times of pain? How often does that come through times of suffering? It's not the only way, thankfully. <laughs> there are other ways. Uh, and it's not even the primary way, but so often uh, we, I, we deepen our relationship with God through times of pain. And that reflects the life of Jesus, does it not? Jesus did not have a straightforward, easy path. He, he walked the path to the cross, the path of suffering and pain and shame. So uh, so often Paul's attitude is so different from mine. Do you remember when we read through Philippians together? We studied through that. Just a couple of quotes from that over in Philippians chapter 1. Paul says, For it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ. You should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. Engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. It's a, just the way he words that is, is just counterintuitive to me. It's been granted to you. Like it's a privilege. It's, it's a gift in some ways. And he's not minimizing suffering, but he understands that to share in the sufferings of Christ, in a sense, is <clears throat> privilege. And again, further on, Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, you know, he's been speaking about how he doesn't care for his own righteousness anymore. I used to pursue that, you know, Pharisee of Pharisee and that whole list of things. He says, tribe of Benjamin, circumcised on this day, etc. But he says, now I don't, I don't want that. I want a righteousness that comes through Christ. And him alone. He then says this in verse 10. That I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. And may share in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death. That by any means possible. I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Paul's desire was to press in. And know Christ. And that involved suffering and affliction. And the suffering is painful. Uh, but it means that you share. In the abundant comfort of Christ also. So he continues in 2 Corinthians 6, sorry, two, uh, 1 verse 6. He says, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are com comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. I don't think uh, Paul could have got the word comfort in there more often if you tried could he if they I, I didn't actually sit and count it but he says it so many times i almost feel when i when i read the passage i'm saying this word too much you know comfort but he's trying to get that hammer that home that this is the god of all comfort but what i love about this verse here is that we can say that nothing is wasted in the christian life nothing is wasted if we are afflicted you know being afflicted and suffering feels like defeat. It doesn't feel like victory in our lives, does it? But if we are afflicted, that has a purpose too because it's for your comfort and salvation. And it shows that because if they themselves are afflicted, they can look at Paul and the apostles and say, well, they were afflicted and, and Christ was afflicted and Christ suffered. So we can receive comfort from them and maybe we're not, maybe we're not doing something wrong here. Maybe there's actually a point to this. Maybe we're on the right track if we're being afflicted for the right reasons. Or if we're just experiencing day-to-day -day affliction that has nothing to do with being persecuted. But uh, they could see that in Paul. But equally, if we are comforted, if Paul and Timothy are comforted, that's also for your comfort. So that's not wasted either. It's all, it's all part of God's purposes, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Because if we can come and comfort you with the comfort we've been comforted with, if you follow, then we can... Then, then that's of benefit too. That's of blessing as well. It's a win-win situation. Whatever's going on, God is using it for the blessing of his church and for his people. Paul realizes that's what is going on here. And God may well have us in a season of suffering so that we can be an encouragement and a comfort to others. And, and you might hear that and go, you want to tell me where to go because actually this is really hard at the moment. I, I don't, you know, and I, I fully understand that, but we don't always know in the time, do we? We don't realize till later when we look back and we go, man, I can't believe that. I can, I know for myself, I can think of um, 
family members who have been through awful times in recent years and just thinking what and are feeling lost, feeling uncertain and thinking what is going on. And it's not until years later they find people, other believers, in the exact same scenario and that they've known these people for decades. And, and, and now they're, they're coming to them and saying, I think the same thing is happening to us that happened to you. And they're able to listen and speak and help in such a way that they wouldn't have been able to do had they not been in that position themselves. It's astonishing the way God can use these things. And it doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't take away those tears that have been shed and all the difficulty that's come with it. But it's, it can be a blessing to others in that way. Patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. He says, our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that you share in our sufferings. Uh, you will also, sh- as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Because Paul has experienced that pain and then that comfort, he says, I know the same thing will happen for you when you go endure these things and endure what you're enduring at the moment. Our hope for you is unshaken because you will experience that comfort also but his their suffering was for the comfort of other believers it served to comfort them because it came from the god of all comfort who comforts his people so that was the the first thing was it was for the benefit and the comfort of other believers comforting i should say but secondly it was to teach them themselves to depend on god This is the second purpose of their suffering that Paul sees. You've got the God of all comfort and to teach them to depend on the God who raises the dead. He says in verse 9, we do not, or I should say verse 8 actually, we do not want you to be ignorant brothers or unaware of the affliction we experienced in Asia. Now this isn't the only part of the New Testament that Paul talks about this particular time, which I think you can read about in Particularly in Acts 19, they had a very, very difficult time there. Uh, A lot of persecution, a lot of pressure, uh, a lot of rejection, a lot of pain, a lot of difficulty. And it seems that this was a particular time. And he says, we want to tell you about this. We don't want you to be unaware of this. It's a particularly difficult time. And whatever went on and all the different things that happened, it obviously sat very much in Paul's mind as as a, a time of affliction and a time of pain. In fact, listen to how he words it. He says, For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. I just let that sink in for a moment. The great Apostle Paul, the one who met the Lord Jesus on the road to Damascus, the one who saw God do uh, incredible works and saw an incredible number of people come to faith and saw all these churches planted, got to the point in his ministry where we despaired of life itself. That's how low and how painful that time was in, uh, in Asia. He says, indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. Yeah, have you ever been in that position yourself? Not in Paul's circumstances, but in that emotional place of turmoil where you just think, I, I can't cope with this anymore. I'm done. I, I'm, I, can't, I can't do this anymore. Whatever's going on, I, I, I would in no way compare my experiences to to Paul's, obviously, and but to many other people's as well. But I, I have a memory of um, just a time where uh, personal life, ministry-wise, everything just seemed extremely difficult. Driving on my way to Bible college, no less, I just completely spaced out on the brink of tears the whole way, thinking, I can't cope with any of this anymore. Uh, and that was, I recall nothing from that two-hour lecture on the, you know, immovability of God or something, you know, I, right, right over my head. Um, and it wasn't until I got into the worship at the college that they had that day when the, the guy spoke and it was like he was talking to me. There was 30 other people in the room, but he was talking to me. And, and sometimes we get to that point where we say, I can't cope with this. I can't deal with this. I, I, I have no strength. And if that's where you've been or that's where you're at at the moment, you're in the best of company. You're in the best of company. Apostle Paul said, we can't deal with this. We, we thought we'd receive the sentence of death. We despaired of life itself. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. 
<laughs> and you can see the way Paul's saying that there, we felt like we'd received the sentence of death. We were dead men. We just thought we can't cope with this anymore. And it's as if, uh, he deliberately says that, isn't it? Well, it's because well, the God of all comfort is also the God whose area of expertise is raising the dead. That's, that's the whole of the Christian faith hangs on the fact that he raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So if you feel you've received the sentence of death, you feel you're despaired beyond life itself. Well, God says that's okay. Actually, and if you say you can't cope with it, that's probably a good place to be because that's true. That's, that's absolutely true. Uh, more than we know, more than we know in our own lives. But when we get to that point, God says, that's okay. You can't handle this. I know, I know you can't handle this. But I'll handle it. Don't worry, I've got this whole thing under control. I have your situation and your circumstances under control. I remember coming away from that day at Bible college thinking, nothing's changed. Circumstantially speaking, nothing's changed. It's all the, all the problems I had on the way up here haven't magically disappeared in the space of two hours. But I remember driving home and feeling like something had been lifted off my shoulders. I, I just thought, I, I, things aren't under control. But I know that God is in control. And I know that he, the God of all comfort and the God who raises the dead is more than capable of handling my little circumstances in the northeast in Lossie. He's, he's capable of coping with that and, and, and handling all of that. Rely on the God who raises from the dead. You know, so much of this, sometimes you hear a lot of preachers and the theologians talk about the Christian life just being a, it should be one of, of ease and one of victory. There is a sense in which the Christian life is one of victory, very much so. But it doesn't look like the victory that the world thinks of. Strength, power, success, health and wealth, having everything you need, popularity with those around us. Paul's life didn't look like that. Not from the world's perspective. And this is part of the criticism of Paul as we go through this letter. How can he be God's man? How can he be the apostle that he claims to be? Look at his sufferings. Look at the way he gets kicked around all the time. Look at, the, look at his weakness. And Paul says, oh yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree with all of that. The only bit he disagrees with is, that I am God's apostle and actually this is the way God works. He works through weakness. And he works through the unlikely people of the world. This is Paul's understanding but it taught him to rely on the God who raises the dead and he delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us on him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again Paul has seen himself delivered time and again by God now Paul knows probably even by this point that his his end will be martyrdom I would think he, he, he knew probably knew even by this point that he was going to die or, or possibly knew that but he knows that God has the power to deliver him again. So he prays that God will deliver him again. And ultimately, Paul will be delivered, even in death. Because death is not a defeat for the Christian. Death just takes us to the presence of God. The ultimate deliverance from sin and death, from hell itself. But these men were in Christ. They had trusted in him. They turned and believed in him. So they knew and set their hope on the ultimate deliverance. Isn't that wonderful? Again, it's a, he can't lose. Paul can't lose, ultimately. If I get delivered from this, from another prison cell, praise God. And he says, but ultimately, if I go to be with the Lord, praise God, because I get to be with the Lord. You know? and, and we talked about that in Philippians, didn't we, where Paul was sort of thinking between, do I stay here and just help in fruitful ministry, or is it time for God to take me so that I get to go be with Christ? You know, it's, it's hard to, to, to keep a man like that down, isn't it? When he doesn't fear death, he doesn't fear, you know, what can you do to someone like that? Not very much. And this is Paul's way of, I think, of understanding. And even this deliverance could come in different ways. It is God who delivers his people. But what's interesting is that he asks for their help in this. He asks for the Corinthians' help. Verse 11, they've set their hope on God as the one who is able to deliver them, the one who raises the dead. But in verse 11, he says, you must also help us by prayer. Isn't that a wonderful thing to understand the power of prayer in that way? Paul genuinely says, uh, God has his plans, but he works through prayer and he uses prayer. So we need you to pray uh, for us so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. So he recognizes that if we're going to get out of the cell or if we're going to move on to the next thing, or I think he's actually traveling, but, but whatever the case, 
uh, we need your prayers. We need your prayers. We need you to pray. It's wonderful to know that as Christians today, isn't it, that our prayers are effective. Kind of Rona was talking about that earlier. God uses the power of prayer. I've, I've said often, uh, probably here as well, that um, when people say, well, all I can do is pray. I said, oh, that's, that's the wrong way to phrase it. And I, 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 I'm sure I've told this story a million times, and Rosie will probably think here it goes again. But, but, um, but I just always remember preaching at the, the, one of the churches in Lossie and this, this older woman that used to babysit us when I was literally, when I was, I was like, and she was now seeing me preaching, and she used to come up and talk to me about it afterwards. And, and she actually said to me, she says, just to encourage you, she says, um, you're getting better. So, and she didn't mean I, I was terrible, but she just meant like, oh, it's good. I was encouraged to hear that. <laughs> you know, I've done quite a few now. I hope I'm not as bad as the first time. But she, she said, she says, there's only, I'm at that age, she says, but I only can do two things. She's really, she says, I can encourage people and pray for them. That's all I can do. As if those are unimportant things, you know, encouraging people and praying for people. Like, oh, don't don't minimize that just for a moment. But you know that prayer and encouragement, two very very powerful powerful things in the church, and prayer is what Paul asks for that they might, even though they, they can't reach Paul physically, far even less so now than they probably would be able to then. Paul still says, "Pray for me," because that that will help us be delivered. But they were taught to depend on the powerful God. Who raises the dead? So, just as I uh, bring this to a, a close this morning, you know, I know you all hear sometimes, you know, preaching churches where I don't know people. Obviously, this is my church. This is the church I'm a member, and I know uh, various people that are going through different trials and, and difficulties. And for those of us who aren't just now, we will at some point. Uh, and for those of you, you might be able to, even today as I'm saying this, look back with that hindsight and think, yeah, I know what God was doing there. and I've seen him work and I've seen him with me all of the way. But you may be in a place of deep suffering and pain. You maybe feel the way Paul and his companions felt where they said we felt utterly burdened beyond despair. and we've, we've, The sentence of death we had received, that's what we felt like. But whatever, however you are this morning, when we look at the suffering of Paul and others, it reminds us of what is actually going on. And, and, and it, we, you can kind of zoom out and get the bigger picture, the perspective on what is going on. Paul saw in his own sufferings that it was to help and comfort these believers in their suffering because they had been comforted by the God of all comfort. And so in turn, they would comfort others. And he says it was also to teach us to rely on the, and depend on the God who raises the dead. And I'm sure God was doing a number of other things in their lives at the moment alongside that. But these are the things that they, they saw. And for you and for me today, let's be comforted in the knowledge that our suffering is not in vain. And it's not wasted. And it's not pointless. And you can't say that if you don't believe in the God of all comfort and the God who is sovereign over all things. A God is at work in us and through us in the midst of our sufferings in ways that we can't even comprehend. As we endure our afflictions, let's look upwards. We have great examples of believers throughout the years, including Paul. As we go through this letter, we'll see more of that. But in suffering, we identify with and we are reminded of our great suffering saviour, the suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. Who went to the cross for us, who suffered and died and bore the wrath of God for our sin. And who is now risen and reigning. God can deliver us from our current circumstances. And he will ultimately deliver us from death and hell if we are trusting in him. And we will be with him forever. Let's pray together.